Hello and welcome to chapters 13 and 14. I apologize that there's a little bit of a delay and change here. The PowerPoints from the usual text that we're using weren't available for this particular section, so I've had to glean them from another textbook. Uh, so we'll be looking at the ocean, but we'll be looking at it in a slightly different way from the PowerPoints that we've been using up till now. Uh, for the backdrop here, I'm actually using one of my own pictures of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this was taken from the balcony of a cruise ship I was on about two years ago, and I took a cruise from San Francisco up to uh, Mount St. Helens, which is in Washington State, and then up the Canadian and Alaskan coastline, and then back down to Vancouver. Uh, so it was quite a lot of fun, and we had a balcony uh, on our cabin so that we were able to sit outside when it wasn't too cold. It was May, but May at that part of the world is still pretty cold. Uh, so we were able to sort of take pictures and be out on the balcony a little bit, but not a, a, an extraordinary amount of time because the water is wonderful to look at, but it really doesn't warm up until about June or July and doesn't stay warm much past August in that part of the world in terms of just normal being out and about. Uh, it, it stays pretty temperate. On the other hand, it never freezes all that much. Uh, it is often colder in Indiana than it is on the Alaskan coastlines. Uh, so I thought I would share this, this photo with you. And uh, I, I, I have actually another photo uh, that I also can post up here if I can find it. Uh, Sometimes Zoom doesn't want to let me find things uh, very easily. Aha, here we go. Uh, this is another image where I took a picture of the sunset. Uh, we were quite a ways north, uh, and it's May, but we were aiming in towards an inlet so you can sort of see the sunset behind us on the walkway on the ship. Uh, so, so I think bo both of those images are, are quite a lot of fun. There was a third image that I took here, and I'll, I'll aim away. You might be able to make out the rainbow. You might be able to make out the rainbow behind me that landed in the ocean as well. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the ocean. I'm a fan of cruise ships too, especially when they have an open buffet that has lobster tail on it, uh, which this was the first, the one and only cruise I've been on that's had that as an option. Uh, but truth be told, I liked the hot dog stand by the pool as much as I liked the buffet with the lobster tail. And I, I did go to the hot dog stand almost every day for lunch uh, while I was there. It was also next to the ice cream bar. I wonder why I had to lose weight this time. Yes. Uh, so uh, that if, if, you, if you can take a cruise, I, I highly recommend it. If you can take one up uh, to Alaska to see glaciers and, and other kinds of cooler things. Don't just go for the Caribbean cruise or the Bahama cruise. Go for something that's, that's sort of interesting and unique. And we got to see glaciers. We got to see uh, raptor rehabilitation, uh, by which I mean not velociraptors, but uh, owls and eagles and other such uh, creatures. And we got to see Mount St. Helens. And I should have tried to figure out a way to declare it on my taxes as something I had to do for class. Uh, but I didn't, so, so there you are. Uh, I ended up paying more taxes than some politicians, apparently. Uh, but not enough of politics, enough of politics. Uh, we will go on to our uh, sharing of the screens, as I have tried to do uh, in times past here. And we'll go to our PowerPoint. There we go. And this, of course, is, is two chapters, uh, and we're going to look at the oceans. And these are from an earlier edition of the textbook, uh, but the oceans are the oceans as they are. Uh, so I will try to hit all of the points in this that are covered in our quizzes as well. So oceanography is the science of studying the oceans. Uh, so if you want to be an oceanographer, you need to study chemistry, physics, biology, geology. Uh, there's going to be a good deal of math in there as well. Uh, so, so just be prepared if you want to do that. But it's a wonderful mix of sciences. 
about the only one that's a little more complex than that would be astrobiology because astrobiology has to include not only oceanography but alien oceanography in all of that. So you get all of those things plus astronomy. The truth is to be an oceanographer, it's also helpful to know a little bit about astronomy as well. Uh, so, so uh, but the oceans are worth studying. More than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean and all of the oceans are connected. There are no oceans that are sort of off by themselves. Uh, so we can call it one big global ocean and we have uh, what's called the oceanic conveyor which takes different currents above the, uh, the, the main body of water that's just sort of just below the surface and below in the colder areas nearer to the, 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 uh, the, the surface of the sort of the, the, the lithosphere, the crust that's on the bottom of the ocean. But if we're looking at the planet, this is a different way of looking at it because usually we're looking at the northern or the, the eastern and western hemispheres. This is looking at the northern and summer, southern hemisphere. Sorry, I can't really talk today. Notice the southern hemisphere is so much more oceanic than the northern hemisphere. That actually does something to our climate because uh, land and water absorb water at different rates. Also, we have far more of the ocean currents swimming around in the southern hemisphere and that makes a difference as well. Uh, so, so this is not always the pattern as we've talked about in earlier chapters. When the continents shift around, there have been times where they've mostly been around the South Pole and the whole world froze over into snowball earth. So we have four main oceans, uh, Pacific, Atlantic, Indian and Ocean, uh, uh, Indian and Arctic, uh, sorry. Uh, there, there is a movement afoot among many scientists to add a fifth ocean to that, uh, which is the Southern Ocean. Uh, if, if you sort of again go back to our area here, this area around the South Pole and around Antarctica, has features and qualities to it that distinguish it from the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. So there are some who are calling it the Southern Ocean. The Pacific is by far the largest uh, and it's also the deepest. The Indian Ocean is uh, not quite as expansive on the globe as the Atlantic is because the Atlantic goes from north to south but it's uh, just about the same size. It's only slightly smaller. And the Arctic Ocean is very small. Uh, again, if you look up here around the North Pole, uh, that, that's less than 10%. Your book is saying 7% of the size there. Uh, when we look at the oceans, we're not just looking at the water, we're also looking at the surface of the planet underneath the water, which is the ocean floor. Bathymetry is the word that we use for this. And uh, if you've ever seen the movie Titanic, when they go down to explore the, the, the wreckage down there, they're going down in a bathysphere. And that it comes from the same word here. We can use all sorts of different things to map the ocean floors, uh, submersibles like those bathyspheres and uh, uh, different kinds of uh, measuring devices from submarines and such. Uh, sonar also works, but also satellites. We can beam things through the water and have uh, our, our readings taken from uh, high up above. And that, especially when we put all of these things together, gives us a pretty good indication of what the floor of our ocean looks like. So when we're looking at things, we can see that there are continental shelf areas that expand off of where we have land. Notice here, Florida, for example. It's three times as wide. The oceans are not that deep just off the coast of Florida for uh, uh, quite a distance, for upwards of 100 miles or more, uh, because it's all part of the continental shelf. If we look over here for Australia, we can sort of see it's almost connected into Asia, and we can see New Zealand down here has a lot of area that it, the ocean doesn't have to go down by very much for this whole area to expand up. And we have this whole area up in the, the Northern European area that shows that Britain, uh, Great Britain and Ireland used to not be islands. Uh, they, they used to be connected uh, to, to the mainland there. 
we can see this mid-Atlantic ridge, which I've mentioned several times before, because it comes up above the, the ocean line here in this place called Iceland. And this is where the continents are separating apart. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I travel up there. Uh, but but there, there's quite a lot of, of activity in the oceans on the floor, and we can see some different indications of movement, this, this sort of stuttering down here, uh, where we see the, the South uh, uh, Indian Ridge. And then this band of island and mountain chain things called the Hawaiian Islands, in addition to other ranges. Notice how long that is. We're, we're talking 1,500 miles or more. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands are above the surface here, and then there's another one called Midway here. The rest of this mountain chain is all underwater. So sonar is sound navigation. Uh, you're sort of beaming something down and waiting for the sound waves to come back. And, and you, you sort of read them off of that. Very basic, no, no, uh, uh, no big mystery there. And that's one of the ways in which uh, uh, especially early submarines would know where each other was. If you've ever seen the hunt for Red October and they ping each other, you have a ping that goes off in one uh, submarine and it can be picked up in another because sound waves travel through water just as they sit, travel through the atmosphere. Uh, different speed and, and they're, they're, the quality of them has changed obviously. But you can actually hear, if you have sensitive enough equipment, people talking on one submarine from another submarine. So as we're doing sonar, we can have the outgoing signal going down, beaming back up, and then we take readings from the sea floor that are doing that. Satellites do the same kind of thing, only instead of using sonar, they use microwaves, and uh, it's called remote sensing satellite technology. But he's, effectively they're doing the same kind of thing. They, they send out their pulses, which then come back up. We can account for the distortions that might be made through water because we can do our experiment here on Earth and then apply the, the changes that we need to be able to adjust. And when we put this together with sonar, we get a pretty clear indication. And then of course, submersibles. Most of them are don't have people in them because by the time you get too far down, even within the, the, uh, the, the device itself, the pressure gets to you. And, and uh, that's one of the things that deep sea divers have issues with, even when they're inside a bathysphere. So mostly we're using rover kinds of things in the ocean uh, by remote control. So we look at the mid-ocean ridge, we look at the basin of the floor, we look at all the areas around the continents. We call it continental shelf or continental margins. Uh, we've got quite a bit here in the Atlantic area, like that big extension off of Florida, as I mentioned before. Uh, not a lot of volcanic activity or earthquake activity around the continents of the Atlantic. Uh, we have some up in Iceland, for example, and, and uh, quite a bit up there. But on the whole, the Atlantic Ocean is a calmer ocean along the way. So we have our continental shelf, we can see the crust of the continents, uh, then we have our slope down uh, into what's called the abyss. We've had movies called the abyss and they, they talk about uh, uh, the dark area, the light from the sun can't penetrate down to this area here. And then we have our oceanic crust, which is thinner overall than our continental crust. In the Pacific Ocean, we have a lot more volcanic activity and earthquakes. Uh, we have a very narrow area because the, the, the plates, some are subducting under others, and the whole plate is turning around. So we have volcanoes in Washington, we have earthquakes in California, we have volcanoes and, and uh, earthquakes in Alaska, we have volcanoes and earthquakes in uh, Japan, uh, just uh, in the Philippines, uh, Mount Pinatubo, for example. Uh, so, so we have quite a number of things in the Pacific. It's much more active. Uh, the continental shelf in general is uh, sort of sloping away from the shoreline. Uh, if you're doing offshore drilling, this is a great place to do it. Uh, a lot of this area used to be 
at various times above water. So you'll have a lot of plant and animal life that has been compressed into oil and natural gas. Uh, if you've watched Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, the dinosaur is coming back as oil. Uh, we also have sand and gravel deposits uh, that are there. And that's actually a very lucrative kind of business uh, that's there. The continental slope is where that sort of drops off down into the deep areas. We do have some uh, canyons that cut into that because the, the, the flow of the water at different levels of the water will sometimes carve out valleys. And uh, we have what's called a turbidity current, which will sometimes sort of, sort of uh, pull things and, and throw the material around. Uh, so, so if you've ever been somewhere where uh, they, they might talk about an undertow or an undercurrent, you shouldn't get too far away from the shore because then it can just drag you down. Uh, this is kind of uh, the same kind of thing, only further out and much, much deeper uh, in, in, in all of that. So continental rise, of course, is where we're coming up to uh, the, the continental shelf. And then we have the basin, which is the deepest parts of the ocean. And sometimes in these basins, we have trenches, uh, which are different parts uh, uh, where the plates are moving around. Uh, so we have areas where the plates are converging or moving around uh, each other. Then we have large areas where there aren't any plate activities and we just call those abyssal plains. Uh, the very lowest areas, not a lot of activity that are, that are out there. Things just sort of settle down. You can occasionally have isolated volcanoes uh, like the hot spot around Hawaii, that's, that's, uh, th that's sort of one hot spot that's formed a bunch of different, different mountains for a very long time. But you'll get the occasional sort of one-off over there or over there. Um, a seamount is an isolated volcano, a volcanic peak, uh, and, and, but it hasn't usually, it, it hasn't risen to the top. It hasn't risen to the surface layer. So, so it's a thousand meters, as, as you can see there, that's like a thousand yards. So we're talking more than half a mile up. Um, and, and a guyot is one of these that's eroded. In other words, it's not producing any more lava, no magmas flowing into it anymore. So over time, it has eroded and crumbled. So seamounts are higher and they tend to still be active. Uh, guyots are eroded and tend to be lower uh, along the way. So, so we can sort of see what's happening here. We'll have different sort of flows down and, and pushes because below the surface of, of uh, the, the, the ocean bottom, we'll still have things moving around just as we have in the continents as well. So we're not going to end up with perfectly smooth areas. Then mid uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is, I've talked about a number of times before, we have underwater mountains that form there. We have uh, different kinds of, of divisions and, and we have uh, sea floor spreading as the Americas and as Africa and Europe separated out. We have new floor forming at that point along the way. And then we get hydrothermal vents. This is where extremophiles live. Uh, uh, what, what's happening there is it's sort of like a geyser underwater. Uh, so we have the magma underneath the surface, which is forming these, these hot spots. You can get quite a lot of things that can live in hot spots. Even though they are so far below the surface, the sunlight will never reach them. But to have life, you need carbon, you need water or liquid, and you need energy. Hydrothermal vents will give you energy. Studying hydrothermal vents, the oceanographers who do this, are paving the way for us to study potential hydrothermal vents on places like Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, which is too far away from the sun to have life as we know it here on Earth on the surface. But down underneath, there may be these hydrothermal vents because we know there's liquid water underneath the ice caps that are on Europa. And we may find life around there because life can exist in these things. They're called extremophiles because they like their file. If, if I'm a bibliophile, I love, uh, of, uh, love books. If I'm an audiophile, I love music. If you're an extremophile, you love extreme things and extreme climates, very hot, very cold. 
Uh, we have quite a number of examples of that on Earth, and we find them in the, these areas here. Uh, when we're looking at the floor of the ocean, sorry, my phone is beeping. Uh, I'll ignore it. Uh, we, we have three main categories, uh, terrigenous sediments, and this is mostly, you think of terra as terracotta, uh, earth-like. Uh, so this is mineral grain stuff and rocks that have been transported out into the ocean that have sort of washed out there. So terrigenous sediment is uh, earth stuff. But then we have biogenous sediments, which are essentially the stuff that come off of animals and plants as they die and leave their stuff behind. And there are two main kinds of those, and we call them ooze. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so yeah, we've got a lot of ooze going on there. Uh, we have, have some that are is uh, calcareous, which is coming from the calcium. Some people can say calcareous. I say calcareous because it seems more Latinate uh, in, in that way. And uh, uh, so that's coming from the like calcium that is produced in bones and shells and other kinds of things like that. And then we have the siliceous or siliceous. Uh, and that comes from the silica kinds of, of, of shells, and especially single-celled stuff and algae will have silicon quite a bit. And then we have the hydrogenous uh, sediment, and this is a stuff that is crystallizing directly in the ocean water. So again, water, hydro, it comes from that along the way. When we're looking at uh, biogenous sediments, this is a real blow up in terms of, of looking through a microscope of some of the sediments that we would see. So if you would just held this in your hand, it would look like sand. Uh, but if you look at grains of sand underneath a powerful microscope, you see lots and lots of stuff like this. Uh, because a lot of this is uh, biological, it turns into oil and natural gas. We get quite a lot of that from the ocean. Uh, you, you've no doubt seen on the news, especially if there's ever an oil spill, uh, different offshore drilling platforms. Uh, we get quite a bit of gas, not just oil, from, from that kind of stuff too. And we can do uh, that in, in part not just by drilling, but by, by digging things up and then processing them. Uh, and they have quite a number of interesting features. If you ever take a chemistry class, you might see some demonstrations uh, like this. Uh, but other major resources include salt, includes uh, uh, include manganese nodules, include other kinds of elements that we get, uh, and sand and gravel. Uh, sand and gravel is actually a very, very big business around the world. Think of all the things that involve building projects. Almost all of those involve sand and gravel in some ways. Uh, and, and so we get more from the oil industry, the petroleum industry, but only just. Uh, so sand and gravel is actually the second most profitable of the businesses we get from the seafloor. Uh, this does not include uh, fishing and, and, and harvesting uh, food stuff, for example. Manganese nodules, as I mentioned before, these are hard lumps of metallic things, which can include copper and iron and other stuff that, that grow around small objects. It's sort of, and, and when I say grow, I don't mean in a living sense, but they accumulate around that. So we say they precipitate, they sort of come out of the dis dissolved water and, and harden around this stuff. And then we get lots of salts. And of course, the most economically important salt is halite, which is, we've, we've seen uh, examples of that in class, common table salt. So these are, this is a picture of some manganese nodules uh, that are there. Uh, when we're dealing with ocean water, it is uh, uh, salty, so we call that salinity. That's the amount of solid material, not just salt, not just halite, uh, but all things that are in there. And we, we typically uh, talk about it in parts per thousands. Even though it's not all salt, the number one thing that is making it uh, 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 not pure water is going to be our halite, our common table salt, NaCl, uh, sodium chloride. Uh, sources of this include uh, the weathering of rocks and uh, other things that are coming up from the Earth's interior. Uh, so if, if we sort of look at the salinity, now here's the thing. 
And for people who aren't watching the video, uh, this might throw them off and I apologize, but this shows why you should watch the video. Uh, the, the, the slide here is wrong. This should be 3.5% rather than 35%. And if you look at this and know that 35% is a third, which would be a much bigger wedge on, on this, uh, you'll note that it should be 3.5% because 35 out of 1,000 is 3.5%. So mostly water in the ocean is 96.5% pure water. That's an A. Hey, I'll take it. Uh, but uh, it's just that 3.5%. And you can see up here, more than uh, three quarters of that 3.5% are Na and Cl, which is sodium chloride, which is salt. Uh, and then we've got 14% more of other things too. Things that can make it more salty, uh, water evaporates, it leaves the salt and minerals behind, or sea ice forms, and it also will tend to leave most of the materials behind. Uh, when the sea ice melts, it dissolves and it, it dilutes things. Uh, when icebergs melt and ru run off from the land, typically will be less salinity, less saline uh, uh, in, in terms of the uh, general water quality, as well as precipitation. Uh, precipitation can have some pollutant impurities, but it's, again, not nearly as much as we have in the ocean. So those things are happening on a regular basis. Uh, we have runoff happening, we have evaporation happening, we have sea ice forming, we have all sorts of things. So, so again, it's a complex process that happens over time. And our temperature on our planet varies in large part due to ocean variation. Uh, the amount of sunlight, solar radiation it receives uh, can affect the overall temperature. Uh, we have what's called a thermocline because sunlight doesn't make it all the way through. Uh, so between 300 and 1,000 meters, you're going to see a big change in the temperature because the sunlight ceases to, 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 to get through there. So the heating effect also tends to not get through there. And that creates a barrier to certain kinds of marine life. The things that like it dark and cold aren't going to go way up there, and the things that like it warm and light aren't going to go way down there. Uh, so, so in that sense, finding Nemo was a little bit wrong. You're never going to have Nemo go all the way down into the darker, darker, darker reaches along the way. But one of the things we also see is the temperature, the more north you are towards the North Pole, the more south you are towards the South Pole, temperature goes down. We also see the salinity goes down, although it goes down much more in the north than it goes down in the south. Then we have this dip in salinity here where it's really hot. Uh, can you guess why? Well, where it's really hot, right around the equator, we have more evaporation, so you have less salinity uh, that's there along the way. Then we have our sort of thermocline when we're in certain lower latitudes around the equator area. Uh, we have a, a thermocline where we're going to have the cooler stuff down below, but we're going to have the warmer stuff up near the, the surface. Then when we're at the high latitudes, so again, not near the North and South Pole, we don't have that because we don't have a warmer area. The, the water is consistently cold. So density matters. Uh, we, we have uh, salinity and temperature. As you change the temperature, you change the density, and that will affect the, the, uh, 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 the overall processes in the ocean, including uh, the conveyor, the conveyor belt. Uh, we have a pycnocline, uh, and the pycnocline is, uh, again, where the, the thermocline area is, where we also have a density change. And of course, the further down you go, the more dense the water is going to be just because of the water that's on top pressing down. Uh, there is an upper limit to that as well. Uh, uh, but again, in the lower latitudes, we have that just like we have the thermocline. And in the high latitudes, North and South Pole, we don't tend to see that happening. Uh, so we have three main layers. 
Uh, we have the shallow surface, we have the transition zone, and we have the deep zone. The surface layer, sun warmed, shallow. You've got lots of mixing of stuff happening there. Then we have our transition zone, which is in the lower latitudes around the equator. We have our thermocline and pycnocline. And then we have our deep zone where it's just above freezing uh, and it's constantly high density water. Sunlight never reaches this area along the way. So the deep zone all the way down here. By the time we're getting up past the North Pole uh, or to the North Pole and, and to the South Pole, uh, we're, we're mostly dealing with deep zone even at the top. Uh, so if you go north of Iceland, for example, the kind of water that you're getting there is pretty much deep zone water. You're going to have a very, very tiny sliver of, of stuff that, that is not going to be deep zone. But of course, that also makes it a little bit better for fishing because that means all the fish that you're going to want to catch aren't going to go very low. They're going to congregate near the top uh, along the way. So, that, so, so uh, Alaskan fisheries, uh, uh, Icelandic fisheries, Norwegian fisheries are always big business. Then when we're dealing with the stuff that's in the ocean living, uh, we have different classifications based on where they live and how they move. Plankton. Plankton is anything, animal, plant, bacteria, anything that drifts. It drifts around. Uh, so we can have animals or we can have, have plants uh, that, that as long as they don't anchor themselves down. Uh, so, so if you've got something that, that has roots into the seabed, that is not plankton. Uh, if if uh, Animals, by their nature, tend to move around. Uh, but, but plankton is, is, uh, can be zoo or phytoplankton. And uh, so, so uh, zoo, of course, zooplankton is going to be animal. Phyto is going to be uh, plants. And we can see the differences here. Uh, and again, again, this is under a microscope. Then we have nectin, which is uh, uh, animals capable of moving on their own. Uh, so, so fish would not be plankton, fish would be nectin in general, because they can wiggle and move. Uh, and, and then uh, benthos are organisms that live on the bottom and can um, uh, typically move around or are rooted into the bottom. And here we have some examples of uh, fish, nectin, and then we have benthos here, where we have a starfish and crabs, they live on the bottom. So we have three different zones. Notice we keep dividing things into threes. Uh, we have uh, certain qualities that we think are important for that. The availability of sunlight. So we have the photic zone where sunlight penetrates. We, if, if it doesn't, it's outside of that. Um, then we have distance from the shore. We have the intertidal zone, which is where land and ocean meet. So we have the tide roll in, the tide roll out, and, and that area is going to be the intertidal things. There are some animals that, that really need that in and out kind of, kind of thing. Then we have the neuritic zone, which is uh, uh, sort of goes out, but it doesn't do the drop off. So again, thinking Finding Nemo, uh, all of those groups that wouldn't go off over to the drop-off, they would be in the neuritic zone. And then the oceanic zone is all the stuff that's out there beyond. It's like, oh, he touched the butt. Yes, uh, I, 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 I do like that movie quite a bit. Uh, so, so you can see here the, the sort of the photic zone, uh, the aphotic zone, which is means no photos, uh, no photics photons. Uh, so, so this would be where it's dark, this would be where it's light, and uh, the, the euphotic zone, that's where you're going to get the most of, of it along the way. And you'll see our, we have our uh, intertidal zone here where it sort of rolls in and out. We have our neuritic zone here where, where Nemo and his family would live, and then we have the abyss way down here. Um, uh, whales and other uh, uh, oceanic creatures can move between these, but most will tend to congregate in one area or another. So uh, the pelagic zone is uh, an, just a sort of an open zone. Uh, if we sort of go back uh, here, it's going to be in, in this area here. The benthic zone is going to be where 
anything lives on the bottom. Uh, so, so the whole bottom is called the, that, and the abyssal zone uh, is going to be the stuff that is all the way down. And then we might have, again, our hydrothermal vents, which we've mentioned before. Some vents will get the water all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius. If you remember your physics and chemistry, that's the temperature at which water boils. Uh, but under this pressure, uh, we, we, it, it, it will just simply warm the water. And then we get organisms, our extremophiles, that really like it in that area there. And we can go down and shine light onto these areas that never have light otherwise. And uh, we, we can see quite a bit of activity going on around these along the way. Then we have some really weird stuff that looks like aliens, like tube worms, uh, that, that are found around that area. So uh, we have productive areas. We have primary productivity, which is photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, uh, which is stuff that comes off of energy from either the sun or chemical processes. Uh, then we can sort of see how, again, in terms of sunlight, we get the most activity going on when we're in the middle of, of uh, sort of from, from one time to another. Our equinoxes are from March until September. Uh, notice that, and that's worldwide. Uh, so, so this is when most of the sun will hit most of the planet. Uh, half of the planet's in darkness over here, half of the planet's in darkness over here. Uh, our primary productivity in polar areas uh, limits uh, photosynthetic activity, uh, again, because the Arctic is dark for half the year. Uh, in in uh, the tropical oceans, uh, we get quite a bit, but they can run out of nutrients because they are so productive. Uh, so, so again, we have a warm nutrient depleted surface water here uh, because it's all being used up and we have nutrient rich water down here. How can we mix those things up? Well, that, that's where the oceanic conveyor belt along the way takes, takes place. Uh, so, so this productivity will change over seasons. Uh, uh, during the winter time, uh, we have low productivity. Uh, so when we're looking at the temperate ocean areas, we can sort of see the different types of things that will grow. Uh, nutrients will be added in the off season. They will be eaten by the uh, plants and mostly animals, zooplankton, here during the on season. Spring and summer are, are those on season. Spring mostly uh, for uh, plants and summer mostly for the animals along the way. Then we have our trophic level, which is uh, uh, where plants and algae are at the sort of the, the, the lowest level, and then herbivores, things that eat the plants, are above them, and then carnivores are above that as well. Uh, when we're dealing with the efficiency of this, it's very inefficient. It, it's not the best way in terms of long-term survival. Uh, food chain, is, is one of those, those kinds of things where this eats this, then this eats this, and this eats this, and, and stuff. Whereas a food web is, well, I can eat this, or I can eat this, or I can eat this in a lot of different ways. Uh, so, so animals that can do a food web, rather than having to only eat the one thing, uh, have a greater likelihood of surviving. Uh, so, so if you have a wider base of the things that you can eat, uh, then good for you. If you can only live on the hot dogs at the hot dog stand at the pool, at the, the uh, cruise ship that I was in, then you'd better book your cabins early because there's only the one. Uh, so, so when we're looking at a food chain, if you run out of things at the bottom, you run out of things at the top rather quickly. Whereas if you have a food web, that can feed into a lot of different paths that can go up to a, a certain type. And of course, a herring is a fish. Certain types of herring require certain types of nutrition, whereas other types of herring are not so elitist, we might say. They're, they're, they're more generic in terms of what they can eat. Uh, so uh, I think that is it for our uh, presentation. I'll stop sharing the screen there.
Um, as, again, I've referenced quite a number of movies here. Uh, Finding Nemo is quite a lot of fun. Uh, and and uh, one of the things I do like about that is a number of the depictions of the fish in that uh, do have bases in reality. So if you get a chance, you might go in and look at that film sometime. Thank you for joining in today, and I will see you on our next video.